Hi everyone, welcome back to Lockdown Lessons Part 7. With me, I've got Liam McIntaggart from Real Fundraising. So firstly, I'll just say hello to you, Liam. Hi, how you have, Phil? How are you? Very well, thank you very much. Very well. So what I want to find out really is a bit more about Real Fundraising today. Now, just for those listening, Real Fundraising is a London-based business um, that focuses in the following areas. I'll let you go into more detail on that, Liam. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, so I'm the Client Services Managing Director at Real Fundraising, and we're a fundraising agency, as the name suggests, uh, London-based, as, as you say, Phil. And we work in uh, you know, face-to-face -face fundraising, telephone fundraising, as well as digital acquisition. And we also do some ethical marketing, so for non-charity clients. OK, so when you say ethical marketing, could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so that's um, again, it's it's mainly face to face marketing um, that would be done at uh, sort of events or, or expos uh, in shopping centres or or via the door to door medium. But we'd be representing companies rather than charities. So um, I guess think Abel and Cole, the uh, fruit delivery uh, box company would be one of our clients that we've worked with in the past. Fantastic. OK, so um, if I could just take your mind back to sort of March the 23rd, Liam, at what point? either before that or, or around that time did you think there might have been a problem commercially for you? Yeah I think because we work predominantly in the face-to-face -face sector um, you know when we started having conversations with some of our vendors about events being postponed and events being cancelled sort of through early February time some you know some large-scale events like your ideal home show, grand designs live, things like that. When we start, you know, having those conversations, we're already thinking, okay, there's probably going to be a, a problem commercially. And because what we do is an intrinsic one-to-one -one conversation, um, whenever there's something that's coming up that's going to stop those conversations happening in a face-to-face -face arena, then you know, there's there's going to be a problem commercially. Great. So so in terms of um, the changes that actually were, were, were enforced upon us, how did you manage to adapt during that period of time? Yeah, um, we were in, a, in a, a sort of a strategic position already whereby uh, we started our own call centre. And from sort of October time last year, we'd been doing a lot of uh, in-house calling. So we do a lot of uh, sort of quality control calling and a lot of calling to really make sure that all of our fundraisers and uh, the ethical marketers are doing a great job with the donors or customers. Um, but we you know, had always planned to take that to an acquisition point. So instead of just being sort of quality checks and, and welcome calls and onboarding calls for, for donors, we wanted to actually start looking at acquiring donors as well via telephone medium. Um, so, you know, we we launched that very quickly when when lockdown happened. Um, it was in the it was in the pipeline and you know, probably something we could have done a little bit, a little bit sooner. But um, the the biggest thing for us was launching that call center, um, uh, the ac for acquisition calling, so we can help some of our clients that had immediately had huge events cancelled and huge amounts of income stopped. We could help them bring in income in a different way. Um, we also then, you know, made sure that within the wider sector of what we do in terms of fundraising, we collaborated with some of the key stakeholders across the sector to demonstrate kind of best practice for COVID safe fundraising when we do eventually return. Um, and some of the, you know, the things that came out of that and the, the positive feedbacks that we had once we did adapt, you know, were, were picked up by the, the BBC, for example, and ran in an article just recently. Um, so that's, you know, really excellent to see as well. Sorry, Phil, I've uh, lost the sound completely. Sorry, I do apologise. So when, when we first went into lockdown, I suppose what I noticed was that people weren't communicating effectively to start off with, especially in the first two to three weeks or so. Um, and I noticed that the people that have actually done well or, or at least uh, stayed afloat during COVID were the ones that actually increased their communication rather than decreased. And it sounds like that was something that you've been doing at Real, right? Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, we have a kind of internal policy whereby we will be as transparent as possible from the directors right down through to the newest member of staff that came to work for us. So from the from the beginning, before we, you know, before we even stopped work, which was well before the 23rd, you know, we were communicating with our staff, making sure that they felt safe, 
making sure that the public felt safe as well. So we were surveying our staff in terms of the perception that they were receiving when they were having interactions with members of the public. And, and we learned quite quickly that there were some, some areas that we worked in that we needed to actually move away from. So um, we moved away from, from doing some door-to-door -door work at the time, just because it was just when people were beginning to self-isolate. Um, and I think it was quite a scary time for a lot of members of the public. Um, and I think we had a lot of time to adapt as a nation to having interactions on our doorstep, whether it be DPD coming to your doorstep or a food delivery, once we'd all gone through lockdown. But before that, I think there was a lot of kind of hesitation. So we moved away from that market because of the feedback we had from our fundraisers and we moved into some other, some other areas. And then it, obviously with sort of events that happened, we then stopped fundraising before we even went into lockdown because we just felt it was the right thing to do. You know, we didn't want to ever put any of our fundraisers or any members of the public or any of the, you know, vitally important support services that you know are out there doing the, the important work they were doing such as the nhs we don't want to put them under more strain by doing what we were doing so so we stopped before lockdown but uh, for us it was really just keeping up the communication speaking with our clients making things really public on you know linkedin which is a great great tool and, and sort of just really being clear and transparent with what we were doing good stuff so would you say you had any sort of wins during lockdown that you'd like to tell us about <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So I think one of the biggest ones for us was actually staff loyalty. Um, you know, we, you know, we use a, like a peer to peer engagement platform that all of our staff are on so they can communicate with each other and they can reward each other when their values are kind of displayed. And, and it's, um, it's, it's great for kind of rewarding, you know, good, good values. Um, it's not performance related or anything like that. It's just about demonstrating the values of respect, ethics, activism, and love, which is what real stands for. Um, and there's a quarterly survey that's done on that. And one of the questions in that survey, and it's only seven questions, but one of them is, you know, would you take another job for a 10% pay rise? And going into lockdown, um, that was, that was sitting at 90%. So we already were doing, you know, quite well. But coming out of lockdown, 100% of our, of our staff said they would not take a 10% pay rise to go and move to another job. And the thing is, when you look at the benchmark for kind of this peer-to-peer -peer recognition software in all industries, that's like 40%. So, you know, that's you know, something that we're really, really proud of, that values are aligned and our fundraisers and, um, you know, people who are doing our events are really aligned with what Real does as a, as a company. Fantastic. Um, sort of peer-to-peer -peer recognition software isn't, isn't something that I think that many companies have actually got involved in in the past. But from what I've heard, it can make a real difference and it really helps engage the, the staff base, like you, like you said. And I, I think from speaking to your colleague, Tom, a couple of weeks back now, um, the, the, the values side of real really came across in that conversation, I would say more so than pretty much anyone else I've spoken to recently. So I, I think that's fantastic work that you guys are doing. So what would you say, what would you say the main challenges that you've had over the last sort of six months that may, where maybe you've, you, you've sort of come up against issues that you've had to resolve quite quickly that weren't easy for you? I, I guess, for, first of all, having to, you know, we stopped every single penny of income coming in while we then quickly rolled out our uh, our acquisition calling but there was there was a period of time where we had zero income coming in so that's obviously the first challenge we think we had about two and a half weeks where we paid all of our all of our employees across the board and there was no even mention of a furlough scheme at this point by the way you know that obviously came a little bit later which was uh, which was brilliant obviously and, and obviously we're like many companies very very thankful to the the government for bringing that scheme in um but we we're in a position whereby we had to, you know, really look at um, overcoming uh, those issues of having no income and really sticking to our core values. Um, we made sure that we kept supporting the small charities that we do through our real ethical fund, uh, which is a fund of sort of money that we used to support very small causes. Um, and we took a decision very early on to, to keep paying that, that money out to those small causes because you know, we, we'd obviously been very hardly hit, but we're a, a company that had planned very sort of safely and we're very risk averse. So we had some cash reserves. But what what we 
what we knew first and foremost was those small charities uh, were going to suffer massively. So we wanted to, to help them. And, and we actually had a lot of our fundraisers volunteering their time and their energy to, to go and uh, help those small causes, you know, write letters, um, get on the phone lines, all those sorts of things, which was brilliant. And we saw that as a nation as well, but that was really, really embodied. Um, and then I think kind of moving through lockdown and looking at other challenges, it was about working with our clients who are, you know, mainly sort of name brand charities in the UK as to how we can return to work safely, um, return to work, um, you know, to protect their brand and make sure that they're really comfortable with us having interactions on their behalf again. Um, so that took a lot of time and planning and training and collaboration with not just our charity clients, but also the sector as a whole and the, the regulatory bodies, the UK government as well. So, um, yeah, some of the biggest challenges that we faced, but we're, we're you know, proud to say that we're, you know, back out there and, and back out fundraising as well. Good. It's, it's amazing. Amazing work you guys are doing. I remember I've got a, um, a friend um, who runs a charity for the elderly locally, and he was telling me, you know, quite frequently how badly small charities have been hit um and mm. what they've had to do to get through and it's been a, it's been an incredibly challenging time like you say a lot of the people that are watching this will run businesses that are have plans through it all some will have been hit badly some will have not been hit too badly at all but i can guarantee that the average charity will have been hit a lot harder than pretty much the average business in the whole country so so fantastic work mm. supporting them so liam have there, have there been any changes that you've put in place during lockdown whether they've been enforced or not that you're going to continue rolling out after lockdown's totally over shall we say yeah yeah there, there, there definitely has and i think that there's probably not many businesses that couldn't say they've had to pivot and learn and adapt in some way going through lockdown and there's a few things you know, i've already mentioned real calling um which is something that we've seen huge successes with we launched campaigns within probably about four weeks for current clients that we were working with uh, we're able to achieve some excellent stats for them because everyone was at home so everyone was picking up the phone um so that that's kind of set us on a great foundation so we're continuing with that and and we'd all, always plan to do that anyway um but that's something that we're you know really excited by and um what we've what we've identified is you know there was an over reliance on certain parts of the business and so integrating other things like video messaging to to certain donors looking at bolting on sort of digital acquisition through Facebook and other social media channels coming into our acquisition to help our clients with sort of more more cross network types of fundraising campaigns which just you know balance some of the risk for them in, in different markets and I think um, then just like as, as any business when you when you have no income you look at all of the income that you've got and you look at where you're spending it and look you know coming up with ways in which we can without you know sort of having to make layoffs for example how we can change our business model to save costs um and and, and adapt there as well so those were all things that we've adapted and implemented and are, you know are going very well great good work so what would you say you've learned about yourself through this time then liam if you've learned anything i think for me personally um probably resilience um i thought I, I thought i was a resilient person already but i think um i was one of the very few people at real fundraising who wasn't furloughed at some point um so you know there was a time when i was you know i was the only hand on deck um as a as a senior director of the company so um resilience through those times because that was you know that was scared that was scary and i'm sure a lot of other business owners are going through or have gone through similar situations um, but being able to kind of look at look at where we'd come from and, and where we were going, you know, we've been around for 11 years now. And, and although this is by far our most challenging time, um, there were you know plans in place and things we could implement to come out of it. So, yeah, for me, for me personally, it was definitely resilience. I've heard that quite a lot, actually, Liam, because, uh, yeah. you know, most people, even if their company, even if their business was in a sound state going into lockdown, um the 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 way the world was changing around them um and it and i'm i mean the world as well it wasn't it it's not a local issue um and mm. the way it's affected pretty much everyone that there was always going to be some element of doubt about what was actually going to happen thereafter even if they were in an okay position to start off with whether it was the supply chains breaking down around them whether it was their customer base shrinking um and and having to look at different areas that, that were working um, and having to just change really be really really rapid 
Um, and I think some of the smaller businesses around probably were able to do that a bit more quickly than maybe some of the larger business that were a bit more stuck. So I, I, I feared for the larger businesses as much as I did the smaller businesses for that reason, really. Um, so um, yeah. what would you say the first thing you did? So after after the first sort of lockdown was was relieved um, and you were able to pretty much do what you wanted within reason, what was the first thing you did then, Liam? I mean, for, for me personally, um, and I'm assuming this was more of a personal question, um, ex it was actually a dinner party, a small dinner party with um, two other groups of friends um, or two other couples, I should say. So there was, um, you know, we'd done regular Zoom dinner parties throughout lockdown. Um, but when we were able to meet up face to face again, the, the six of us got around a table and, and broke bread, shall we say. So, yeah, that was that was lovely. Really good. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I was a bit zoomed out at one point in terms of um, quizzes were the thing that I, I quite enjoyed them to start yes. off with. I got to the point I was doing four or five a week at one stage and I was thinking, oh, I've had enough of this now and I'll just cut it off. I didn't want to do it anymore. And, and a couple of Zoom socials and dinner parties and stuff as well. But um, nothing like meeting face to face, is there? And that's the only that's the no, only thing not. about what, the way where, we, where we've come from over the last six months. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And, you know, there's there's nothing better than, you know, face to face and, and being there in real time and sharing a bottle of wine. Great. So, so coming back to come back to the business side briefly to wrap up. Then, sure. Um, if you could just let us know um, who your ideal customer is at Real at the moment, just in case they're they're watching this and they'd like to get involved and they'd like to find out more about what you're doing, Liam. Yeah, sure. So we work with um, national charities um, of all different sizes, um, international charities as well. Uh, they don't just have to be UK based. Uh, and some more kind of regionally focused type charities that work sort of like hospice charities, things like that. And, and what we do for them is we help them increase their regular giving portfolio in terms of people making payments by card, direct debit or one off, whether that's through face to face or telephone and digital platforms. And we also work with purpose driven businesses, um, usually businesses that work on a kind of a subscription type model. Um, but that could be anything from food delivery services. Uh, I mentioned Abel and Cole earlier, but Gusto, those types of companies, um, right, right through to sort of more promotional type um, ethical marketing as well, where you might see some people handing out um, produce in the train station or something like that. Um, so that's that's really what we do from both real fundraising, real calling and real ethical marketing as well. Great. So so imagine I was your ideal customer. What what would be the first what would be the first stage in the process of actually um, would, would we would we meet up on Zoom to find out more about each other? And how would how would that work? How would an initial conversation go in your eyes? Yeah, exactly right. So, um, you know, reach out to, to myself um, or get, you know, get in touch with real fundraising through one of our many social media channels or online. Um, and we'd have an initial call. I know we're all zoomed out at the moment, but unfortunately it would, would probably be by Zoom or by Teams, depending on their, their, their choice. I know some companies don't, don't allow Zoom to be used internally. And we just run through what Real's all about, you know, real fundraising, real calling, real ethical marketing. We're values based. We're a, a B Corp. Um, you know, we're really, really proud of our culture. We've been finalists for the Business Culture Awards uh, the last couple of years. I've, I've judged at the Business Culture Awards myself as well. And, you know, just find out what real is all about. How can we help them um, have better conversations, uh, you know, that are values based with their customers or potential customers um, or donors, you know, if you're talking charities. Lovely. That, that's amazing. So in terms of if someone wants to get in contact with you, Liam, would it be yourself they'd be contacting directly or would it be one of your colleagues? Yeah, so it would be it would be myself to begin with. Um, and then depending on what they're looking for exactly, it may well be that I would sort of hand them over to someone else to, to sort of take the follow up. So the easiest way is to get in touch with me, whether it's on LinkedIn, um, you can find me there. You know, can check out Real Fundraising or Real Ethical Marketing on LinkedIn as well. And we're on all the other social media channels. Or you can jump on to our websites as well, uh, which is just realfundraising.org. Fantastic. So, so what I'm going to do after this call then, Liam, I'm just going to, once I've posted this on the social channels, I'm going to pop your um, email address and your um, phone number. Would that be a wise move to put that into the comments below? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. 
Fantastic. Well, I won't ask you to spell everything out now because it will be below in the comment section. But so for now, Lim, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate that. Fantastic to find out more about what Reels do and how they've been helping. And maybe we'll catch up soon. Thanks very much, Phil. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed some of your other uh, episodes. So yeah, keep keep doing the, the great thing that you're doing. Superb. Thanks very much, Liam. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.